Welcome to the video review of our chemical reactions. This is a video meant to help students pass a content assessment in a summer platform for science in middle school. But if, even if you're not such a student, if you are a middle school student and you have to learn about chemical reactions, this video will be helpful for you. Okay, so uh, the first object we have to cover is what is a chemical reaction? How is it different from physical changes? And what's really the types of chemical reactions? What's happening during one? Remember, chemical changes are those that actually change matter's composition. You make a new substance, bonds are broken, bonds are formed. So rusting, burning, um, chemical reactions, cooking, uh, rotting are all going to be examples of that. Versus a physical change, which does not alter the chemical composition of matter. You have the same chemical, the same substance before and after, even if it changes appearance, like changing the state of matter, like going from melting or boiling or changing the color or changing the shape. So things like cutting stuff up, shredding it, mixing it. Uh, all of those would be physical changes versus things like burning, rotting, make, uh, chemical reactions, explosions. Those would be chemical changes. So chemical reactions are, of course, chemical changes. And there are chemical changes that because during a chemical reaction, atoms bond with other atoms or lose the bonds they used to have with other atoms. In other words, bonds are broken and formed during chemical reactions. As you see up here, the pieces will either separate form or change or trade places so that new substance end up forming. And during a chemical reaction, the properties of the substance that form will be different from the ones that, made, that started because the reactants and products are not going to have the same characteristics because they're new chemicals. That means they will look different, they will act different. The physical and chemical characteristics of what comes out is not the same of what comes in. So when you burn hydrogen gas in the presence of oxygen gas, right, you may make water. And then water is liquid at room temperature, while hydrogen and oxygen gas are actually going to be gases. Hydrogen is very explosive. Oxygen makes fires worse. Water puts out fires. Obviously, the properties are not the same of the reactants versus products. Here are some indications of that chemical reactions actually took place. Light, gas, precipitates, color changes, or odors are usually going to be accompanying chemical reactions. You do not have to have all of them. And even if you have one of them, that does not necessarily mean chemical reactions are taking place. Because it's possible to make light without it being a chemical reaction, like flipping a switch. It's possible, of course, to have a gas without a chemical reaction. Um, like, for example, when you open the stove and a gas leaks, and all of a sudden you have a formation of a gas. Or when you have uh, a water vapor coming out of the water that's boiling, that's not a chemical reaction. Same thing with formation of precipitate, color changes, and emission of odor. They don't have to be indicating chemical reactions, but typically when it can be actually in spaces, one, two, or more of these things will tend to take place. Now, there are different types of chemical reactions. Those that build things, like which is called synthesis. Those where things are separated, so compounds are broken. Those are called decomposition. Those where one compound switch places with the element of another element, and you can make a new compound and a new element by itself. And that's called single replacement. So they're kind of like one of them trade places or where two compounds have their elements all switch places. And that creates a double replacement. There's also the famous combustion reaction, which is when a source or fuel burns in the presence of oxygen because of a spark to create exhaust, which is usually carbon dioxide and water. If there's a complete burn, if not, there's like ashes and then you get heat. And that same heat will go back to the start and power the spark for to keep the reaction going. And so long as you have fuel and oxygen, you're going to keep the fire going. Now, the second objective talks about the parts of a chemical reaction equation. The arrow means that you're going from one place to another. Okay, so that's called, it basically means U's. So you're going to start from one and make the others. The things before the arrow are called reactants. The things after are called products. Now, the, usually you're going to see this going from left to right, but it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, sometimes you have reactions that have arrows going both ways, and that just means the reaction is in equilibrium. In a chemical equation, the little subscripts next to the actual letters means the number of atoms that you have of that element in the actual um, formula. For example, this says that there's four hydrogens in the methane molecule. So the little numbers mean the number of atoms within the molecule of that type. Uh, the numbers before a molecule, like this two here, mean the number of molecules that you have of that type in the reaction. So this is saying that in order for methane to burn, you need at least two molecules of oxygen. And then you end up making one molecule of carbon dioxide with two oxygens each and two molecules of water, which have two hydrogens each. So that's what the subscripts and coefficients mean. Subscripts, the number of atoms in a molecule. Coefficients, the number of molecules in the reaction. 
So, right, so here's another example of reactants and products. Now, the third objective talks about this idea of conservation of mass. And that's just the idea that matter cannot be created and destroyed, certainly not during chemical reactions. So that means that the total number of atoms before and after, the number of atoms in the reactants and the, and the number of atoms in the products has to stay the same. But not even just that. The total number of, of atoms of each type has to stay the same. They have to stay consistent. Also means that the total mass is conserved. So uh, in this reaction here, if you actually count the number of atoms of each type, you will see that the number of atoms on the left of carbon are the same number of atoms of carbon on the right side. You have one carbon on the left, you have one carbon on the right. You have four hydrogen on the left, you have four hydrogen on the right. Two per molecule and two molecules total, and so forth. All right? So you can see that very clearly here, that the total number of atoms stays the same. When water forms two molecules of hydrogen with two hydrogens each, that's four hydrogen totals, combined with one molecule of oxygen with two oxygens each to make two molecules of water. Now, the two hydrogens you have here, the two, uh, two oxygens you have here were there to begin with. And the four hydrogens you had there are there to end up with. So the total number of particles stays the same. Nothing is created, nothing is destroyed, and the total amount of mass stays the same. So, for example, if you have 18.02 grams of water, and now you're breaking it down, the opposite of what we just saw, and you know that you ended up with 16 grams of oxygen, that means the difference must be in hydrogen gas. That means you have to have 2.02 grams of hydrogen gas so that when it's added to the 16, you have the same as you had before. So the idea is that you add up the total for the reactants, and it, that total must be the same in the products. And so if you have how much mass of one of the products, then you know that the rest of the mass must be the difference of those two. So in this case, it would be 36. The last objective is that it's about the difference between reactions that absorb energy and release energy. And we call them exothermic, as in exiting in thermal heat, and endothermic, as in absorbing heat. So the reactions that are exothermic are going to release heat, while the endothermic ones are going to absorb it. So for exothermic, think explosion. Think reactions that make the outside hotter. Endothermic, thinks, think um, uh, absorbing energy, so the opposite of an explosion. Think building something. So exothermic, think demolition. Endothermic means building. So during an endothermic reaction, the temperature is going to drop around, around the outside. While in the exothermic, the temperature is going to rise because it's releasing that energy. Endothermic reactions are unlikely to be spontaneous, while exothermic tend to be. Endothermic reactions tend to build more bonds than they break. They build complex things, more, more complex bonds. While the exothermic ones will tend to break more bonds or build less complex bonds. So that means endothermic reactions will increase order while exothermals will increase disorder or decrease order. You make complex products that have more energy than the reactants. So the reactants are simpler in endothermic reactions versus exothermic ones, which make complex reactants in the simpler products. So you're losing order, right? So, for example, in photosynthesis, you get simpler things like carbon dioxide and, oxygen and water to make something complex like glucose. While in cell respiration, you do the exact opposite. You break down the glucose into the simpler carbon dioxide and wa water. So when you're building something like a protein, you're going to absorb energy. But when you're digesting food, you're going to release energy. So that's why photosynthesis requires sunlight, energy to build something. And cell respiration releases energy, which, of course, the body uses for it, right? So it's the exothermic ones which are going to tend to produce light, to look like explosions. So the way I think about this when I'm taking a test question, I just think, is it if it's if it's like an explosion, it's exothermic, right? Does it release energy? Does it make the outside hotter? Is it likely to happen on its own? Now, having said that, even exothermic reactions, which are likely to be spontaneous, like burning something, do sometimes require a spark to get them going. So this graph is slightly a misconception because it's meant for a middle school student to review. But technically, you have to go up in energy before you can go down and release the energy because you need to have a little bit of activation, a little spark to get the thing going. But once you get the spark going, the reaction will go on its own. And that's why it's considered to be spontaneous. So that's it for chemical reactions. I hope you found this helpful and see you the next time. And you know, don't do anything that wouldn't make your mama proud.